okay, now that we've defined the discrete time convolution, we want to know some, maybe we want to know some things about how it works. And so now we should maybe look at what are the properties of the discrete time convolution. Maybe that'll help us later on when we want to do calculations. So the goal is to be able to apply properties of the convolution formula, but I guess, you know, maybe we should, we should stick with saying understand first. You, know, you understand first and then you apply, right? Okay, so here are a couple of facts about the convolution, which we'll go over in the next few slides. So here's just some notation first. We're going to write y of n is equal to x star h of n, or y equals x star h if the time index is in, you know, sort of clear from context. And we're going to use that notation to write uh, the, the convolution sum. So this is equal to x star h of n. So one thing you might want to know is, OK, I'm writing it as x star h, but does the order matter? Here it seems like the order matters, x of k and h of n minus k. So nice nice thing is actually that, in fact, no, the order doesn't matter. So you can take x star h and h star x, kind of like times, is a special type of multiplication. And uh, so the, these two sums, these two sums here are equal to each other. And that's a property you can prove, uh, you know, just by kind of looking at the definition and then doing a change of variables. Um, another important fact is that it's associative, so it really is behaving like a multiplication. If I take x star h and then I pass, so that's taking x and passing it through a system h, and then I pass it through a system g. That's the same as taking x and passing it through a combined system, a combo system, which is h star g. And finally, it distributes over addition. So again, like multiplication, if I take g plus h, two systems g and h, and I want to apply both g and h to x and add them up, then I can just add up the systems themselves and then, and then convolve with x. So I can create a combo system, g plus h. OK, so how do we show these properties? So let's start with commutativity. I said you could do it with the definition. So we want to show that x star h is equal to h star x. So let's start with h star x. So here's h star x in our same notation. And then what do we do? We take this um, n minus k, and we said, say this is going to be equal to n. And then this k is going to be n minus n. And so uh, then looking at the limits of the sum, we're now going to be summing over m. m is still going from minus infinity to infinity. But now I'm multi multiplying x of m and h of n minus n. And you know we can just swap those two because uh, if you want to be really fussy about it and have things in the right order, and so then we get this sum, which is just actually the x star h, right? So um, h star x is x star h. So why is commutativity useful? Well, sometimes the calculation is easier one way. That is, uh, I set up the sum one way with x of k, h of n minus k, and that might be hard, but somehow writing it as h of k, x of n minus k, like the algebra or something, becomes easier. So that's one, certainly one reason. The other thing is we can, the, because of the symmetry uh, between x and h in the convolution, you can think of this output y as either being x of n passed through a system with impulse response h of n, or a signal h of n passed through a system with impulse response x of n. And both of those are kind of equivalent. And so from seeing the output signal y, you actually might not be able to tell uh, which one of these two uh, is the case, which one of these two diagrams, the, the top one or the bottom one, is uh, actually going on in, in behind the scenes. What about associativity? So you can also show associativity using just um, uh, from the definition, but it involves like you'll now have double sums and it gets a little messy, so um, we're not really going into the algebra here, although you can you can easily find that online. Um, so the idea of associativity is useful because basically it says if I apply h1 and then h2, it's the same as applying this combo system h1 star h2, so h1 convolved with h2. And so it, it allows us to compose systems, and it also allows us to swap the order of systems. So I can also say that this thing is the same as h2 star h1 of n uh, and so I could think of it, and I could think of this then as saying I'm going to pass it through h2 of n, and then pass it through h1 of n. 
right? So I could swap this two to make it a one and swap this one and make it a two, uh, and I would get the same answer. So this is actually pretty useful um, because it says that maybe maybe it's you can build it more cheaply one way or the other. That is, I can build, um, I can I can cascade these systems in a way. One in one way, I have to deal with some. Um, more expensive components to make everything work or not blow up or something like that, and then I could, instead I could do it the other way and it could be cheaper. Okay, what about distributive distributivity? So again, it's kind of this this thing of can I merge systems? Can I understand a big system in terms of smaller pieces? So if I had a system which had impulse response g of n plus h of n, then I can think of it as x being applied to two in parallel to two different systems g of n and h of n, and then adding them up. So this means that I can do a calculation. I can do x convolved with g, I can do x convolved with g, and x convolved with h separately, and then uh, do them separately and then add them up. Right. So that's uh, that's sometimes it makes your life easier in terms of algebra, and it also lets you simplify block diagrams to understand kind of the overall input output behavior. So we want to understand a little bit of language that we use around discrete. Uh, time LTI systems. So the impulse response is the output of the system when the input is delta of n, the unit impulse function, hence the name impulse response. So everything is in the name, really. It's the impulse response. It's the response of the system to the unit impulse. And as I've said multiple times now, we call LTI systems or the impulse response uh, or its impulse response a filter. And if now we can think of two different types in discrete time. We can think of two different types of filters. One is where h of n, you know, this bell ringing, um, you know, kind of s the, it stops at some finite time. So that is, h of n has kind of finite length, and that's called a finite impulse response filter. The name meaning finite impulse response. The impulse response is finite in length, and that's in contrast to one which has like infinite impulse response. And so you can think of a, a decaying exponential uh, if we had um, uh, h of n is equal to um, alpha to the n u of n. This is a decaying exponential, so this is iir. This is iir. And uh, you know, if we look at something that, like this, just like three lollipops and then and zero everywhere else, right? this would be fir. So that's the picture you should have. And you'll see a lot more about this kind of discussion uh, if you take the DSP class. So. Again, and I can't stress this enough, the critical fact that we have learned, that theorem that we saw, is that the output of a discrete time LTI system is only a function of the input signal and the impulse response. So the impulse response tells you everything about what the system is doing. Causality, stability, all those properties. It's all in the impulse response. And so what we really want to do in this class is build up an understanding of how does the way the impulse response looks, or the values in the impulse response, how does that relate to describing what the system does? And once we understand that, then we can try to design an impulse response with a nice shape, or a good shape, that will have nice properties to be able to do something. And we want to be able to design filters to accomplish certain tasks, specific tasks. So that's really what the, the idea uh, behind driving uh, a lot of the material in this course is to get to that point. You want to get build up enough of a foundation so that you can start designing things, uh, designing filters which have good properties.